So um, we're not going to get into chapter six of Revelation tonight. All right. So I need to take time this evening to talk about, and it's going to be a little bit technical. So y'all kind of just hang with me as best as you can, and I'll do, I'll do my best to communicate well and to teach this clearly. Because when we, when we study the scripture, there are systems of interpretation to which we need to be mindful. So, um, so just hold tight. Let me get some things together on my end so I can get, get the screen going, and then we'll, we'll be on our way. Okay, so up to this point, we have studied Revelation, and we have... We have seen the introduction to the book. We've seen the vision that John was given of the resurrected Christ. We've also have seen the letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And then we have moved from the letters to the churches, where we moved from the vision that John saw in chapter one to the letters to the seven churches, then to the vision in the throne room, right? Revelation is just a series of visions. A vision of Christ, chapter one, vision of, uh, oh, that resulted in the letters to the seven churches in chapters two and three and chapters four and five. There is the vision that John had in the throne room of heaven. Chapter six, we get into a different series of visions that John sees. So how we understand those visions is important, right? So I want to take some time this evening to talk about some ideas. I know it says theories here on the screen, so don't let that frighten you, but it's just different ideas of what it means pertaining to the millennium. When we, when we say the millennium, uh, we're talking about Revelation chapter 20. Turn there with me, if you will, in Revelation chapter 20. All right, in Revelation 20, it, it reads as follows. Just read with me here. John says, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having a, the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil, and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Also in verse four, John says, I, and I saw thrones and they sat on them. The judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshiped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Verse five, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years, yes. Then in verse seven, now when the thousand years had expired, then of course Satan will be released from his prison. We'll talk, we'll get to that point where we'll understand more of what is being said there, but there are some ideas as to what this thousand years means. And, and the way those thousand years are understood functions as an interpretive grid by which we understand revelation or Try, we interpret Revelation. So here are the ideas. Again, hang with me here. Um, this is going to be important for us to know as we, as we read our study through the remainder of the book of Revelation. So there is this idea of a classical or historical premillennialism. When we say millennialism, again, it's how we understand those thousand years. So the classical interpretation, I will explain that. Next is the dispensational premillennialism. I know these are big words. Don't worry about them. I will explain them. I'll, I'll break them down into very, um, very small bite-sized pieces for you. And then there is post-millennialism. Post -millennial, post and then there's ah-millennialism. 
Let me explain what all of these mean. Okay, so the classic premillennialism is this. And I even got a chart to show it to you as well, so you'll understand it. I'll explain why it is important. So when we say classic premillennialism, we usually associate this with a futuristic reading of Revelation, meaning everything in the book, it, it pertains to the future, right? Everything within the book itself has a futurist interpretation. So what happens is when we talk about the end times, there are various persecutions that the church faces up until the end of time in which the church will be delivered from these persecutions when Christ returns, all right? So basically what this means is the church suffers persecutions in various waves and various, um, various seasons of its existence, and then they, they intensify until the end times at which Christ returns. All right. And then when Christ returns, what happens? Well, there's a resurrection of believers. The believers are raised up from the dead. Right. And, uh, and, then, and then that what follows is a literal 1000 year period when Christ reigns on earth. All right. And then after that, Christ, after that 1000 years, as we read in Revelation 20 and seven, Satan will be bound for those 1000 years. And then there will be a final judgment where unbelievers will face God at the white, at the great white throne judgment. And uh, those uh, who have been judged at the great white throne judgment will be cast into to the lake of fire. And then what follows after that is a new heaven and a new earth. Here's what this looks like in chart form. All right. Again, I'm, I'm nerding out here a little bit, but y'all need to hang with me. Okay. Sometimes you, you have to put your thinking caps on to, to deal with what scripture says. All right. Okay. So here's where we live now, right? We live in this church age, in this tribulation period. Church age right now in which we live, we'll get to the point of the tribulation. The tribulation happens at the end of the age. Christ comes, right? He, he takes up believers. Some we call that the rapture. Uh, believers are taken up. To meet Christ, that's, that's the resurrection of, of Christ, I mean, of believers to Christ. And then immediately what happens when believers are, 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 are resurrected, then there's a return of Christ to the earth during, the, um, during that, uh, that battle of Armageddon. That battle of Armageddon takes place here. Christ uh, wins the victory, then follows the millennium, 1,000 years. And then at that point, after those 1,000 years, then the unbelievers are raised and judged. And then after that point, there is the eternal state. Okay? That is the classic premillennialism. This is the position that has been held by the majority of believers throughout time. And I'll, I can print these out for you as well if you would like it. Uh, I just didn't tonight. And so I didn't want to overwhelm you with this nerdy stuff but you sure can i will i don't mind i don't mind sharing it yep i don't mind at all okay so that's classical all right put a pen there here's a here's a different all right so that we talk about classical premillennialism now we'll talk about dispensational premillennialism there's different dispensations in which people understand how things happen in the end times all right so in revelation the first three chapters deal with the church age, right? We talked about the first three chapters and then the letters to the churches. And then, and then after the church age, the church is raptured or lifted up from the earth, okay? Then, as I mentioned, uh, the rapture is interpreted in chapter four, verses one and two, meaning that when, when John sees the 24 elders, when he sees the worship of God around the throne in chapters four and five, that is a symbolic of the church being raised up in heaven. Okay. And after that, the middle sections of the book of Revelation, these 16 chapters deal with Israel on the earth. 
during a period of great tribulation that does not affect the church because the church has been raptured and is in heaven. Okay? So, so when, you, when we read uh, chapters, um, actually chapters 6 through 19, that all those tribulation, all of those judgments that have, that have been poured out and the Antichrist and, 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 and what he does, that happens, uh, that happens with Israel. The people of Israel, the, the Jews, and that they are the ones who are suffering um, the uh, the wrath of the Antichrist. Uh, then, at the Battle of Armageddon, chapter nineteen, Christ brings with him the raptured Christians and establishes the millennium in fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. And then, after that, again, Satan is released, final rebellion. And with Satan and his angels, they all are judged, great white throne judgment, lake of fire forever. Satan and, his, and his, all of his demons, they are judged forever. So this is dispensational. It deals with different dispensations of history, and it interprets Revelation as being strictly chronological. Okay? So here's what that looks like. Um, and you have any words right at the end. Right, this, is what, this is what that looks like, right? So we talk about the church age. Remember the last slide. You had the church age and the tribulation kind of together. You didn't have this break here. Uh, this is where many Christians believe that Christ comes, he raptures the church, right? Believers are resurrected, they're raptured. And then we have the seven-year tribulational period. You have these seven years. Where at the end of the seven years, during the tribulation, of course, the Antichrist, he, he wreaks havoc on the earth. And then Christ returns the battle of Armageddon with believers and he wins the, wins the battle then comes the millennium then the a great white throne judgment and the eternal state. You see the difference there between those two. Okay? This, if you read the um, if you read the left behind books anybody read those books? This is the left behind theology. This is what it um how it is written because, you know, the rapture happens and things are just going on and planes crash and all these kind of things, right? And so the tribulation happens after that. Seven-year period, okay? So that is one or another interpretation of the book of Revelation. Now, here's another um, interpretation. This is not as common, but there are some people who would hold this view. Uh, don't, this term right here, preterism, means that simply that Revelation, like all of the other books in the New Testament, applies to past time events, okay? Meaning that it has no future indication. It is all about what has happened in the past. Everything that we see in Revelation applies to the church of its day, right? Unlike, I mean, not unlike Ephesians or are Romans, right? They're, the book is written for the churches of that time. All right, so it takes this thousand-year reign of Christ as figurative, meaning that there's, there's no such thing as a thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth, that this is a figurative meaning. As the Bible says, you know, a thousand years is as a day, and a day is as a thousand years. So there's no literal 1,000-year uh, reign of Christ that's going to happen on the earth. It, it, it means that uh, the millennium just means a period of time where believers are on the earth and they are living out uh, this millennium in a figurative way. So Christ comes at the end of whatever this time frame is. It's not a thousand years, it's just some time. And so here's, here's where, I, you know, which is an interesting viewpoint for the post-millennialism. It says things on earth get better and better until the church ushers in the return of Christ. Okay. Meaning that, you know, people get better, society gets better, the church gets better, and then all of a sudden we get the house so clean that Christ has to come up, he can visit, he can come back. This is, a, believe it or not, if you study, um, if you study colonial America, anybody heard of Jonathan Edwards, the great revivalist, and George Whitfield and those guys? They believe this. Here's why they believed it. Because they saw America as the city set on a hill. They saw the literal America as the New Jerusalem. They believe America was going to become this nation that would be 
so Christian that it would usher in the coming of Christ. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, so, look, as great as, uh, I mean, th those guys did great work. I mean, I, I read some of their works and I appreciate it. And even some of the Puritans, Puritans, many of the Puritans believe this. But, uh, but th things were, you know, as great of this vision of Amer that America was during the 18th, 19th century, it still had a lot of problems, a lot of problems. So somehow in the midst of this America being seen as this new Israel, new Jerusalem, um, you still had some ugly things happening in America like slavery. Somehow slavery was surviving all of this revivalism stuff. But anyway, things on earth were not getting better. And, and so in other words, they had this viewpoint that there are those who still believe now have this optimistic view that things on earth, we, we, we need to make things better so we can finally make this world good enough for Christ to come back to. And so Christianity eventually gains victory over the world. This again, this is where you have the, nas the Christian nationalistic ambitions. Christianity over politics, in politics, because Christianity has to invade every space of the world to gain this control. And, and this is why in the um, sort of in the dark ages, you know, in the, uh, you know, 900s to 1000 AD, um, you had um, you had the Catholic Church, you know, taking power over kings in Europe and England because they had this view that the church has to be the one in power in order to make the world right. All right. So that's a viewpoint. So here's the here's it graphically depicted. So you have a church age and a millennium that all comes together. And at some point when things are good enough, Christ comes back, resurrects believers, and there's a judgment you have in your earth and then eternal state. It's a really simplistic view of what happens, or how we understand revelation. Okay. All right. And the last one is ah millennialism. Ah meaning no. This does not believe in a literal um, 1,000 year period. And so this is a, a position advocated by people known as idealists, meaning that they take the entire book of Revelation. It has no historical meaning. It has no futuristic prophecy. It's all about reading it and making spiritual application of everything that you see. So if you see a beast uh, with having, you know, uh, 10 heads uh, or, or 10 horns, you know, well, well, that just means, um, you know, um, people can uh, see evil in a certain picture, right? It's a way to see evil. Evil is, is, uh, is strange, right? They, they interpret everything that way. When you talk about the dragon, uh, the dragon is just a picture uh, of, of, um, of something that wants to uh, cause uh, destruction to people like a fire breathing dragon or something like that. So they spiritualize everything. And so um, everything that we read in the book of Revelation is figurative, meaning that Christ doesn't, he never actually has a literal reign on earth, uh, certainly not for a thousand years. And, and Christ, uh, how, so, so what is the millennium? The millennium is this, it is Christ reigning in the heart of believers. That's the millennium, not Christ having a physical reign on earth. It is Christ reigning in the heart of believers. And so the millennium is fulfilled in a spiritual manner through the ministry of the church, right? This is, this is how Christ exercises his rule on earth is by the church doing ministry. And then when we look at the end of Revelation, again, this is the battle of Armageddon. We'll get there. We'll talk about what that is. Uh, but it just says those are just the, the, the last battles their complementary views of the last battles when Christ returns. If you look at, uh, again, church history, you know, again, nerd stuff here, but you had some of the uh, theological heavyweights like Origen and Augustine, this is what they believed. Also, uh, Luther and Calvin, they were the Protestant reformers during the uh, 16th century. Uh, they believed this. They, didn't, they, they had this view that the amillennialism was the right way to interpret Revelation. So, um, I remember when I when I taught uh, uh, at Mid America, I knew a, some students that are taking this viewpoint, and um, 
and I asked him why, and um, I never got a satisfactory answer, but I, I, re I reasoned that the reason they took this viewpoint was because they had parents or other people who were older who had premillennial viewpoints and they didn't want their viewpoints. Kind of like you know, young people do, they don't want to be where their parents are. So, uh, so they'll just take this viewpoint for that. So here's the all millennial living. This is what it looks like. So right now, the church age, so they see Revelation 21 through 6, what we've just read, as, as what's happening right now. We are in the millennium. Christ is reigning in the hearts of his people. But one day Christ will return. He will resurrect believers and then judge unbelievers, new heaven, new earth, and then we'll, we will go into the eternal state. Okay? So I've gone through those viewpoints there. I, I've, I've shown you what they mean. Because, and these are the primary viewpoints. There are others that are out there that are more strange than these. Um, but, uh, and make, you know, maybe a, a fraction of the sense as these make, but, um, but these are the main ones that you will, you will read about when you study the book of Revelation. All right. Um, so why, why does this matter? And this is why I wanted to talk about this. You know, what do we do now that we have looked at these system of interpretations, which one is right? Okay. Which one's right. And which one do we take when we study the book of Revelation here. Um, let me just say this, regardless of what interpretation you may hold or that you may be inclined to take. No system of interpretation answers all the questions, okay? No system of interpretation is bulletproof. Um, there are faithful Christians who are Dispensationalist. There are faithful Christians who are classic premillennialist. There are faithful Christians who are postmillennialist. There are faithful Christians who are all millennialists. There are faithful Christians all over this interpretive board. So that means whatever position that you may hold concerning uh, interpreting the book of Revelation, hold to it loosely. Don't make it a point of essential doctrine because it's not um why the lord didn't make it clearer for us i don't know <laughs> you know um I, I wish it would have been crystal clear to us you may say well is it even worthwhile trying to understand the right way to interpret it absolutely it is it is uh we don't just kind of set it aside and say well just because i don't understand it i don't want to try to try to understand it no we need to pursue understanding the lord um gives us the uh the privilege of what's called the perspicuity of scripture the scripture does have clarity in some places uh, but revelation is a is a book that is not as clear in terms of how we are to interpret everything that's in it so no system of interpretation answers all of the questions that's okay that's okay all right secondly um as I mentioned, this should not be a matter of essential doctrine. Now, there are some churches that will have a eschatological interpretive position, and you must hold to that position to be a member of that church. This is not one of those churches. <laughs> okay, if, um, if you hold to any one of those four viewpoints, you can be a member of this church. I do not consider this to be an essential doctrine. So, which means if you believe that, that the rapture is the next event to happen on the, uh, on the eschatological calendar, hey, good. Let's go. That, praise God. If you believe that, well, the church is going to go through the tribulation, and, and then at the end of that tribulation, the, the rapture will come, it's okay. Or if you believe that, well, you know, this is all symbolic and the church really, you know, really needs to focus on being faithful in ministry and not, not just looking for a rapture to escape this world. That's fine. You can still be a member here. Or you can say, well, hey, I, this, all this millennial stuff, I'm, I'm just, you know, I, I don't care about it. I'll just, you know, live for Jesus, you know, all millennialists. That's fine. Okay. It, it is not worth dividing over. I have heard, I've witnessed some intense <laughs> debates uh, about this, and, and even some who would 
hold that these are essential doctrines over which there must be uniformity. Uh, I disagree that there has to be. So, so I believe we give each other grace in this. Being that, again, throughout church history, God, there's been faithful Christians that have had, had you know, uh, sort of different levels of understanding of these things. Okay? So, so we have to give each other grace on that. Uh, there are two clear, clear biblical truths here, all right? I do want to make sure that we, we, all, that we all understand, okay? I, I think that these are the, the non-negotiables, <laughs> okay, that the Bible teaches. First of all, Jesus is coming again. He's going to return, right? Whether he returns before the Great Tribulation or he returns in the middle of the Great Tribulation or at the end of the Great Tribulation, he is coming back, okay? And secondly, the Bible teaches us without, without any you know, confusion that we must be ready for his return. That we are to live as if Jesus will come back at this moment, okay? So, so those are two clear biblical truths that you'll hear me in teaching through Revelation, I'll come back to these. We're preparing for the coming of Christ and we want to be ready. I believe that is what uh, this book essentially communicated to Christians in the first century, communicates to us in the 21st century, all right? And, and then lastly, um, this is where I want to encourage us pastorally. Whatever our understanding is, as best as we try to reconcile these truths and try to rationalize them and, 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 and try to use that to understand the scriptures, let's just be faithful to the understanding that we have. And if, by, if, if we are maybe a bit off, but if we are, let's say if we have the wrong system of interpretation, let's ask God for grace that we be faithful in whatever interpretation we do have. I believe God can honor that. I believe he will. So in other words, let's say if the proper system of interpretation is dispensational premillennialism, okay? And, and say someone believes in amillennialism, we'll say, Lord, may that person who has that amillennialist understanding, may they be faithful in living out their, their Christian life in a good, um, godly disciple of Jesus in that, in that understanding of all millennialism, okay? <laughs> What's that now? They, they would be, but you know what? They, they be, they, that would be a pleasant surprise, right? You know, that, uh, that's a pleasant surprise. So, uh, so that's what I want us to do uh, because uh, as we go through this, as we get into chapter six, the judgments are coming. They're, they are unleashed. And, and so now we need to understand, well, What's, where's the church in all of this? Is the church in heaven while this is taking place? Or is the church on earth in the midst of all of this that's taking place? Okay? Um, so, um, so anyway, any questions on this? I, I wanted to talk through this. Any questions on the system of interpretations? I knew that was coming. I knew that was coming. I set myself up. I did that intentionally. And I should have known Davida was going to ask me that question too. Because she always asks those insightful, those well thought questions. She's a thinking Bible student. I love it. I love it. I love it. When I taught this uh, class at school, I, I, I asked the same question. I said, any questions? And somebody, I, I threw that curve, I threw that softball right across the middle of the plate. Somebody hit it out of the park. Okay. Um, I'm glad you asked. I'm going to answer that, okay? Bibles, turn with me in Matthew chapter 24. <laughs> we'll give you a Bible answer, then I give you the reason for why I believe what I believe, okay? Matthew chapter 24. All right. I believe when we understand Scripture, it's best to interpret Scripture with Scripture. Best to correlate Scripture with Scripture. All right. So Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, here's how it reads. 
now as oh, let me say this for those on uh, on the call, they may not may not have heard your question, Javita. But the question is, what do, what do I believe? What does the pastor believe? And so I'm I'm setting us up now to uh, to give that answer. All right, in Matthew 24 verse three. This is Jesus here. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Okay, so that question is pertaining to what? The end times when Jesus is going to return and establish his kingdom. Now, Jesus gives the answer. In verse four, he says, and Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. He's already given us a hint here that at the end time, there will be great deception. You know, when right becomes wrong, wrong becomes right. People, yeah, people will have you to believe that truth is false and false is truth, right? So he says, take heed. In other words, stay Stay faithful to God's truth. Verse five, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled for all these things must come to pass, pass and the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. When you read, when you read Revelation six, these things are happening to a T. When the judgments are unleashed, these things start to take place. Verse 9, then they will deliver you up to tribulation, to tribulation to kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Verse 13. Verse 13, but he who endures to the end shall be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Here is your pastor's viewpoint, and again, I hold it lightly, um, but I hold this viewpoint. All the viewpoints that the church age will end with the great tribulation that the church will go through that tribulation the church will be the ones that christ is talking about here who will suffer the persecution christ is talking to the church calling them to endure to the end and um and also at the end to preach the gospel to all the nations as a witness to him i believe that tribulation will uh, we'll, we'll end with Christ coming to call up believers to himself and then an immediate return of believers. As we meet Christ in the air, we come with him as he brings the final judgment that ushers in the millennium. I do believe in a thousand year millennium. And then after that, the uh, great white throne judgment and the eternal state you have in the earth. That's the position I hold. I've not always had this position. I've, I've, been, I've been a classic, uh, disp I'm sorry, not classic, I've been a dispensationalist for quite a while, uh, but when I read the scripture, when I look at Revelation and understand what Christ is saying here, I believe he's talking to the believers who, the apostles who are the foundation of the church, we say to them, will be, uh, I believe will be uncommon upon the church. Now, some will say this is, this is, he's talking about the Jews. I mean, that's I can get that, and that's, that still will, will that will fit if you take that position. Um, but also in the first century, the first century church uh, would have seen Revelation as a book for them to endure, to stay faithful, to persevere through persecution, through all of that difficulty. And so, if there was a uh, if there was a rapture that that would remove the church from all of this that has taken place. And I believe when you look at the, the churches who were the, uh, who were the recipients of the letter in Revelation, the letter, shall I say, most, many of those churches were not Jewish churches. They were Gentile churches. They were suffering under the hand of 
the Caesar cult. They, the, the, this book was a, uh, was, an, um, was a call for them to be faithful. So the book to me would not have as much um, relevancy to them if it was only applied to the Jews in the end time for most of what it was saying. So it's my, my belief. I, I, don't, um, I, I don't hold that as any test of a uh, <laughs> fellowship. But, but this is what I would believe that the scripture teaches and how I would understand the book of Revelation. All right, so, but if, if you hold to, to this viewpoint, which again, a lot of my brothers and sisters do, that's fine. I, I have no problem with that. I see a lot of good, you know, Bible verses that support this view. Um, I do believe that God is not done with Israel. I believe that Abrahamic covenant is still uh, going to um, be, um, is going to be fulfilled in what, what, what he said. And so, you know, these seven years of the tribulation there, that, you know, that could take place when you look at Daniel and how the, um, the timeline that, that unfolds, uh, that redemptive timeline, it, you know, the church age does put a pause on that. And so when Christ comes and raptures, raptures the church, that restarts that eschatological timeline and the tribulation happens. And then I get that. I, I don't, you know, um, I don't um, say either one is not being faithful to the Bible who holds this viewpoint. Um, but I, I would just, I've just come to a different conclusion there. Okay. Yes, it, it, it is. Actually, what all the classical does, it takes the tribulation, puts it at the end of this and brings these together. You know, if you're talking about the seven years, then, you, you know, you, you would have to do something with that tribulation, how to fit that in the seven years. And so um, that means you would have, let's say, you would have a post-tribulational premillennial position. <laughs> okay. There, there is a pre-tribulational uh, premillennial position. There is a mid-tribulational premillennial position <laughs> as well, right? Depends on when the rapture happens here. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so again, I hold my viewpoint very loosely. Not that I'm, I'm wishy-washy, but I just don't believe that we have enough evidence to fully support the um, any one position and to say that this is this is rock solid and you can't be a Christian unless you hold this position. Now, the dispensationalist view, this viewpoint here, has become more popular as of late. Actually, if you study Christian history, this viewpoint really didn't take didn't gained much traction until the uh, late 18th century into the 19th century. Um, it hasn't, it doesn't have a long history in, in, the, in, the, in the belief of the church. Um, so, um, but you know, we got faithful Christians already in glory who have held various ideas on this. And, um, and, and as I said, it's not a, not a test of fellowship. It's not a matter of, of gospel um, gospel um, commitment. So anybody else want to share what their belief is? I mean, you can, you can, okay. <laughs> You're honest. <so. laughs> you want to get out of here. I'm, I'm out of here. <laughs> I like that. You know, that, I, I like that. For that reason, I would love this position, right? <laughs> I don't want to see all this stuff go on, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Also, the reason I, I, I think about this as well is um, I think in some sense when you see what happened in the Old Testament, Israel, you know, they, you know, while they were in Egypt and in, in the place were being, you know, sort of executed on, on Egypt, you, you had the people of God being protected, you know, through all of that. He did. You did, and, and, and that, is, that is a position that, uh, uh, that is a view that supports that position. Uh, like in Sodom and Gomorrah, right? God rescued them out of that judgment. And so, uh, so yeah, so again, that's, again, every position has strong points and points that, that, that are not fully um, answered. Yeah, well, certainly none of these uh, viewpoints can pinpoint the day or an hour. They, they can take some of these things that are happening and see those as a, a season that the um, end times will take place. So it's not necessarily knowing the time, but, uh, but 
you make an excellent point because when you look at history, there's been many times where um, where the Christians have thought this has to be the end. But 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 when you read in Revelation, at the time the book was written, all these things were happening. In, in t- to a worse degree in some ways. You have some of the same issues happening then and now. Now, I think in our day, there, there are some unique things like AI and, you know, you know, world, you know, world, um, one world order. All those things are actually taking place that could not take place then. Uh, but, uh, but you're right. I mean, believers throughout the ages have really thought that we, we have to be living in the end days. And so, oh, yeah, trying to have a common currency, uh, cryptocurrency and all those kinds of things. We're going to talk about that, some of these cultural developments that really are supporting, um, uh, getting us, I say, ready for what the Antichrist wants to do. Here's, here's what we're going to see in Revelation. We're going to see as, as these judgments intensify, the people of God become more faithful. God is moving. God raises up a faithful remnant. And um, it's almost like as one gets stronger, so does the other. As God, you know, as the church gets um, serious about its mission, Satan gets more intense about persecuting the church. So, so that does happen. Because right. if, it, if it was, then we would look for these specific triggers before we get ready. But the purpose of scripture is, again, to keep us on our toes. We always stay ready. So I believe it's a good thing to think that we have to be living in the last days. Like, I really believe now that we really are living in the last days. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, universalism. Yeah. Well, it, it, yeah, it, it goes back to uh, when I started reading in Matthew 24 in verse, um, in verse, uh, verse four, where Christ says, Christ says, take heed that no one deceives you, right? That's going to be a great deception. All of these false, these false ideas will be just propagated and just be flooded. And, um, and we have to guard ourselves against that with the truth of God's word. Um, and and, and those, those false ideas can be disseminated much more quicker now because you can just you know, pick this up right now. You can be on the road you know, at the red light and reading false doctrine instead of driving your car. Right? <laughs> People behind you, you know, ready to go and blowing their horn because you're reading some, some mess, right? <laughs> But, but it's, it's so readily accessible. And, and, and now, especially our kids are, you know, they are, they're vulnerable, right? If they're not grounded in the truth, they'll read these uh, things and, and they'll take, uh, take hold of them. And then, you know, then you try to disciple them out of it, right? Um, it's, I think we're just primed now for much more deception to happen, more than ever. Because at least before, you know, you could go to someone locally and just, you know, the, and the information couldn't pass around so quickly. Well, now you can just get it, read it, believe it in a, in a few seconds. So, so anyway, I wanted to do this before we, we went further in Revelation. So next time we meet, which is not next week because spring break, we won't meet next week. But a week after that, we'll meet and we will uh, we'll get into chapter six. From chapter six all the way to 19, we're going to see judgment poured out. We're going to see the coming of the Antichrist. We're also going to see the church still being preserved and there being worship in heaven. So God is still in control of it all. The judgments don't pour out until it is executed from heaven. So the, these things don't happen by happenstance. God is, is making it take place. Father, we thank you for tonight, and Lord, just to be able to uh, put our minds to these ideas, and Lord, um, we understand that our, um, our understanding is uh, not clear, Father, as your word says, we see, um, we see dimly lit right now, uh, but one day, Father God, we, we shall see clearly, and Lord, then we'll, um, we'll see you, who is the embodiment of truth, and you are the truth. 
And Lord, for now, let us um, let us seek to live faithfully that which we know, Lord, because uh, in, in these systems that we saw for the most part, whether classic um, uh, premillennialism or dispensational premillennialism, uh, Lord, faithful Christians can live out their lives to glorify you in those systems of belief and Lord, and not bring shame to your name uh, and make disciples and to do great ministry. Uh, Lord, uh, and, and that's what we're after. Uh, we really aren't after a theological position, precision to such a degree that uh, we divide and fight or shame and, and, and get caught into endless debate. But Father, we just want to know your truth and, and live in a continuous state of readiness. So, so when you come, Lord, we won't be found wanting. So Lord, thank you for this study and uh, as we are going through this, this wonderful book that uh, shows us uh, the great victory that is in Christ and we look uh, to Christ who is our Savior, our Lord, and the one who uh, is the resurrected Lord and the glorified Christ. And, uh, and Lord, we know we will reign uh, with Christ because he has gain the victory for us. And Lord, thank you for uh, that reminder. And may, may we hold on to that truth in the, in the darkest and most difficult of times. We ask it now in Christ's name. Amen.